Hello and welcome to The Late Show. Today is uh, Monday the 30th of October. I'm hosting the programme tonight, uh, Simon Barrett, and I'm joined by two very good people as we discuss the importance of the Balfour Declaration 100 years on. I'm joined by uh, very famous uh, Tim Vince, who uh, is loved and adored by our viewers here on Revelation. Infamous. Absolutely. Infamy. They've all got it in for me. And uh, we also got uh, Stephen Jaffe from the Board of Deputies and, and a regular on the Middle East Report. So, gentlemen, welcome to the programme. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'll start off with, with you, <coughs> Tim, because, uh, you know, it's now just over a week before your vision has been uh, really seen, really, and, and that is the um, big event that you're organising at the Royal Albert Hall mm. uh, to remember and honour the signing of the Balfour Declaration 100 years on. Um, can you share with us um, how you came to have this vision to organise something big, something that was going to show you know, Christian Zionist support for Israel and mm. the Jewish people by celebrating the Balfour Declaration? Mm probably goes back about four years ago and funnily enough um, Stephen had a part in it because um, uh, you with John Levy came to meet me at Moggerhanger Park mm -hmm. and said well, could we um, draw together all the Christian um, uh, groups and organizations that support Israel and can we actually create something which you know is more public because many many of these organizations have done tremendous work but most of it's behind the scenes and uh, the, the Balfour Declaration was talked about four years ago and we thought well that would be a worthy um, event to commemorate and why not and we even said then why not take the Albert Hall and so a lot of effort has gone into making a very professional presentation um, with a lot of amateurs, but a lot of some tremendous um, reenactments of historic events. But taking a, a line which isn't covered that widely, and that's the evangelical support for Israel that goes back a couple of hundred years. And you, the, many people don't know that Will, William Wilberforce's home was the, where the site of the Albert Hall was built at Kensington Gore. So the evangelical heritage that once had great influence in our country led to the great reforms, social reforms, led to the abolition of slavery, and led to the Balfour Declaration, which was uh, and is, and of course there are, there are always people who argue against any event in history, but it had a tremendous positive influence in laying the foundations for the Jewish homeland. Mm. Uh, and, and Stephen, you know, here representing the Jewish community, what, what's your reaction to uh, Tim's uh, vision and actually f fulfilling it now uh, as we're at, uh, about just over one week away from the biggest Christian Zionist event in living memory, really, to organise an event to honour Balfour, honour the Balfour Declaration at the Royal Albert Hall? Well, I'm hugely excited by it. I've got my ticket and I'm really looking <laughs> forward to going. So it won't be an exclusively Christian uh, Zionist event. There no. will be members of the Jewish community there. Absolutely. I think it's tremendous vision. Uh, I didn't realise I was there at the start of it, Tim. That's, yeah. that's quite something. Uh, and I, th I think it's just the scale of it. I think it's hugely encouraging for the Jewish community. Sometimes we do feel that we're alone. Uh, and this shows support on a national platform like the Royal Albert Hall. I think is a real shot in the arm for the, the Jewish community. I'm really looking forward to it. Mm. Uh, and uh, just a week to go, it's mm. exciting. And Excellent. we can't hide. You know, it, nowadays, as, as a Bible-believing Christian, there is nowhere to hide. So you might as well stand up and be counted publicly for what you believe in. And, and the event is not political, it's educational. It's actually shining a light on a chapter, of, an amazing chapter of history at a time when they're against the grain of uh, Christian anti-Semitism through the centuries and against the grain, let's say, of British imperialism, which wasn't necessarily favorable to the establishment of the Jewish state, 10 members of a 12-member war cabinet were Christians and had Christian upbringing. Whatever their various professions might be, that was their heritage, and so they had sympathy so that in itself is something worth noting um, as, a, as a historical phenomenon, that there was 
this, this tremendous influence of evangelical Christians at the highest level of government in the British Empire. Absolutely. And uh, just to remind you that uh, we are live, we are interactive tonight, so I'd love your views and comments. And one particular question we're going to pose to you, was the Balfour Declaration a force for good? And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Stephen, I've shared a little bit because I've, I've been focusing on the Balfour Declaration now for the, for the last month on the Middle East report. So I know it's significant, but um, can you share with us uh, two very exciting events that you both have attended in the last couple of days? Uh, I know that Tim spoke at uh, the Board of Deputies and uh, also that you're at a, a meeting of the Speaker's House for all the Friends of Israel, all the Parliamentary Friends of Israel groups, uh, in which Boris Johnson also addressed uh, this group, talking about the importance of the Balfour Declaration 100 years on. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to say that within the Jewish community, we have got over 100 events to commemorate and celebrate the, the Balfour Centenary taking place right across the country from uh, Glasgow and Belfast right through uh, to London. So these are two of the earliest events in, in our week of uh, celebrations, uh, a meeting of the Board of Deputies. It was fantastic to have Tim there because I think it's really important for the Jewish community to recognize and appreciate what Tim was talking about, the evangelical Christian background to the Balfour Declaration. We know there were all sorts of factors, uh, causes behind the, the Balfour Declaration, but that startling fact that a, such a large percentage of the, of, the, of the war cabinet had that biblical understanding about the Jewish people and its connection to the land of Israel and wanted to do something really significant to support it. So that, that is something that I think the Jewish community should be aware of, that Christian Zionist aspect and how, how significant it was uh, for the Balfour Declaration. So Tim was speaking to our uh, monthly meeting of the Board of Deputies. We have representatives coming from the Jewish community from different synagogues, different communal organisations. There was about, I think, about 200 people there, mm. we'd say, Tim. Mm. Tim was wedged in between the Earl of Balfour, who was speaking, uh, Baroness Deitch, and the uh, Ambassador of Israel. So it was a significant uh, commemoration in itself. Uh, and then this evening we were at an event at Westminster at the Speaker's House with the gracious permission of the, of the Speaker of the, of the House of Commons. Uh, again, to celebrate the Belfast Centenary, we had representatives from the uh, Labour Friends of Israel, Conservative Friends of Israel, Lib Dem Friends of Israel. I was standing there with my good friends from the DUP from, from Northern Ireland, all coming together to, uh, to celebrate and commemorate uh, the Balfour Declaration. So that was a, a, another significant event right in the heart of Westminster. Absolutely. And also, uh, we have uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu mm -hmm. coming here as a, a state visit to, to mark the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. Isn't this something that Christians can be proud of? Something that uh, you know, Christian Zionists can have a real, um, a, a, almost wear it like a badge of honour, in a sense, to realise the significance role that Christian Zionists played in helping to bring about the Balfour Declaration that became the birth certificate for the modern state of Israel. Yeah, I think, we, you know, we're very conscious of the, the whole spread of Christian history. So, it, you know, it's with humility that we, we think, wow, at that point in time, you know, we had maximum impact. Uh, it's fair to say we don't have the same level of influence today. So in humility, we, we, it's all, I've likened us a little bit to UKIP. You know, once the referendum's over, what's the point in UKIP? And there was an aspect of that with the Balfour Declaration. A lot of effort and I think a lot of prayer went into, you know, righting uh, a, a wrong, a historic injustice, um, and yet conscious of the fact that the Lord's hand was in it. So. That was a point in time a hundred years ago. Of course, it's wonderful to think that we are part of a heritage of, that goes back really to the translation of the scriptures into English, where the common man, and I consider myself, I might be pinstripe suited up, but <laughs> I, I consider myself part of this vision of William Tyndale, that the ploughboy would understand uh, 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 the scriptures as much as the highest in the land and to read the plain English of the Old Testament prophets and see that God's promises are so clear you can't evade well what's happened actually in the evangelical world since let's say the Balfour Declaration is a spiritualizing of everything but we take a plain reading of, Eng of the English Bible that says God 
will be faithful to Israel, to his promises. Psalm 121, very clear. And of course, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, you know, I will not forsake this people. So we've carried that through the Puritan era, through, you know, all, all the reformed teaching, right up, and I think we're the inheritors of that tradition that believes in the plain reading of the Bible uh, and the primary interpretation of the prophecies, which is to do with the people of Israel. Of course, that can be a metaphor also for the church, for our lives, you know, how you can, uh, things can dry up, things can actually, you know, die even. And yet, as Job 14 says, you know, wood has hope, even when it's chopped down, you know, with coppicing, things can come back to life. And that's what we've seen with Israel and the Jewish people in the last century, and very humbling, is far beyond our power to have achieved it. As you know, there was a confluence of, you know, geopolitical events on a massive scale, but yet there were these few Christians, you know, at the heart of the empire, who decided a hundred years ago tomorrow on the text of the Balfour Declaration. Incredible, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. Right, we've got a couple of emails uh, and text messages through already. Uh, this one says, is security at the Royal Hel uh, Albert Hall a big concern, bearing in mind there'll be many Jews and Christians in one place, Mark? Well, it's the Royal Albert Hall, so uh, I'm sure security will be uh, incredible. Uh, this one says, uh, fantastico. Uh, thank you all, and that's from Fran, so thank you for that one, Franz. And please do feel free to uh, email into the programme. Um, how do you think the Israelis will be actually be marking the uh, Balfour Declaration? Um, because we know that Britain, as a world empire, played a huge role in helping to re-establish the Jewish state of Israel. We know ultimately that it was God that used the British, uh, the British Empire and um, offer Lord Balfour to actually create the Balfour Declaration, which became the political driving force um, for the Jewish people to return to the ancient covenant homeland in the Middle East. But we also have to thank the likes of uh, uh, David Lloyd George, but also um, Theodore Herzl as well for, the, for establishing a political ideology and movement to, to actually have influence on world governments to help the Jewish people return home. So I think that the question is, well, how will Israelis feel about yeah, it? Well, I, I think uh, they appreciate that the Balfour Declaration was a, a significant milestone uh, towards the re-establishment of a, uh, a Jewish state. I'm not sure that they would recognize it as the birth certificate, which is uh, a phrase I, I hear a lot of. I think they would see it as a significant milestone because Britain was the first international power to lend its support uh, to, the, to the Zionist cause. In terms of what the birth certificate was, well, I think we probably all agree it's, it's the Bible, which I think is Absolutely. the fundamental uh, birth certificate of the Jewish people's relationship with that land. Uh, but I think they will see it as a very significant uh, step. It, it turned Zionism from uh, being a kind of a fringe movement to one that was on center stage. It was the platform that enabled uh, the Jewish world to take their case to the peace uh, the various peace treaties after the First World War. It was enshrined, uh, as we know, as part of the San Remo Agreement and, the, and central to Britain's mandate in, in Palestine. Of course, uh, many Israeli people have a, a negative memory of that British uh, involvement as a result of what happened during the mandate, particularly in the period in the run-up to the to the Second uh, World War and the, and the block on, on, on refugees and immigrants. However, I'm hoping that the Balfour Declaration will remind the Israeli population of that period further back when Britain was at the very vanguard of, uh, of promoting uh, Zionism and at that early stage as a milestone, a very significant milestone in the creation of the state. Let's have a look now at uh, Eric Steckelbeck uh, interviewing Roy Thurley, who's also part of one of the key players in helping to establish uh, what is going to be a fantastic night on Tuesday, the 7th of November at the Royal Albert Hall to celebrate the achievement of the signing of the Balfour Declaration 100 years on. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the following Declaration of Sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet.
His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. The Balfour Declaration was the beginning of really a massive new chapter in the 2000 year longing of the Jewish people for its land. Of course, Jews had never forsaken the dream of return. And uh, that return, Shivatsi on the return home to Zion, was written into every Jewish heart. But it wasn't until the 19th century that that process of return really gathered momentum. In 1876, the British novelist George Eliot wrote perhaps the first Zionist novel, Daniel Deronda. And there was a huge wellspring of feeling in Britain, very much among Christians, that um, you know the, the, the dawn of a new age would see the return of Jews to their land. 20 years earlier had been the first Zionist Congress, Theodore Herzl's dramatic shift of Zionism from a dream and an aspiration for individuals to a political program. The fact of the Balfour Declaration was the first shift of this from an aspiration to a real possibility. So this was the first time a national government had said Jews have the right to return home. It was a bold and history transforming act. What was unique about the Balfour Declaration was, I think, three things. First of all, this was the ultimate anti-imperialist gesture. Don't forget, between uh, the Roman conquest and the First World War, Israel had simply been a part, an administrative district in an empire. Christian empires and then the various uh, Islamic empires, ultimately by the Ottoman Empire. So it had never been a nation in its own right. So as part of this new world brought into being in the First World War, one consequence of which was the final uh, death of the Ottoman Empire, was a sense of giving lands back to their original inhabitants, all the lands given back to Arabs, given back to Jews. So it was the anti-imperialist gesture. Secondly, it was the only bit of this gesture covering all the regions, which actually reaffirmed a historically grounded state, the biblical state and land of Israel. All the others, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, were all artificial creations that had never existed as nation states in their own right. And that is one of the reasons why even today all those areas are riven by ancient tribal and civil animosities. Whereas Israel was the only country that had been a nation state of its own for a thousand years from the days of uh, the judges uh, to um, the final Second Temple period. So it was a beautifully anti-imperialist gesture and it was the restoration of a historic nation to its historic homeland. And the third thing that was so powerful but tragically not fully realized was that it provided Jews with a place of refuge. Now, had there been open access of Jews to the land of Israel, I don't know how many millions of Jewish lives might have been saved during the Holocaust. But of course, what happened during the Holocaust was that Jews realized there was nowhere they would freely go. But the fact remains that the Balfour Declaration recognized that Jews as a nation, subject to a thousand years of persecution, needed a place that they could call home in the Robert Frost sense of the place where when you have to go there, they have to let you in. And that was the uh, former chief rabbi, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, talking very articulately and also philosophically about the uh, Balfour Declaration. Um, Tim has, and this is the program we posed to the question, was the Balfour Declaration a force for good? Firstly, 
and well, firstly, what a pleasure and a privilege to be sharing a program not only with <laughs> you know Stephen, Jeff, and Jaffe, and the greats Simon um, Barrett, but um, Jonathan Sachs. It, it's obvious listening to what he's saying that it was a tremendous force for good, just purely on the basis that the Jewish people would have a place of their own, free from the control of, of another government that you don't know might in one generation swing into anti-Semitism as it happened in Germany, or could easily have happened in Britain uh, and in other Western countries of the Western Christendom. So that no one can deny that in that regard, it's, it's, it's a great force for good. But it, it, it wasn't a done deal, as we know, after after the Balfour Declaration and the, the early years of the British Mandate, there were those in the colonial office who, who were trying to stop Jewish immigration and trying to increase Arab um, migration to the land. And um, there, there was a, Christ, a Christian Zionist who you wouldn't, most wouldn't have heard of called Wyndham Deeds, um, who <clears throat> was there working as the Chief Secretary to Herbert Samuel, the first um, British representative governor over there during the mandate period, it, it was it was a fight, because you know land land is the significance of the land. You know it took on a new form after all the years of it being a backwater um, under the under the Ottomans, and people can say, well, you know you've got to avoid confrontation. You know it can't be a force for good if there's there's a dispute. But I'm afraid. Again, from our scriptures, we know that there, there's a force for good, and there are others who are the enemies of what's right and, and, and what's good. And um, you, can, you can rewrite history and recast it in different ways, but it was a force for good when it was penned. It was for the best intentions. I, I find that very interesting, the anti-imperialist, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a, a slant of it. And that's credit to the British uh, uh, empire. I mean, I mean, th there's no other empire that would just, probably since Cyrus, <laughs> that would actually say, well, the, the, the Jewish people can have their own land. There, there's plenty of other empires that had an opportunity to do it. So that is a credit to our country, I think, and, and I would say the Christian influence on government. Absolutely. Force for good. Definitely. So we are live and interactive tonight. Love to hear from you. Uh, will you be attending the night to honour the uh, Balfour Declaration at the Royal Albert Hall next week? Can so I make a comment on security? I, I mean, the Albert Hall is well used to large numbers. So we've got already thousands booked. Um, they've got multiple entrances and um, they're more than capable of... <laughs> And we'll have the Israel ambassador there. So if you've got the Israel ambassador, you've got good security. No, that's very true. Yeah. That's very true. So let's have a look at the uh, trailer now for this uh, incredible event. It's going to take place uh, next Tuesday, and that's Tuesday the 7th of November at the Royal Albert Hall, a night <coughs> to honour the signing of the Balfour Declaration. You are invited to the Royal Albert Hall on the 7th of November this year, 7.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. We will be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, where Arthur Balfour gave his declaration, a message from the British government to the Jewish people to say there should be a homeland, and it has our support, a homeland in Palestine. Join Revelation TV, join Bible-believing Christians from around the land and Jewish friends to celebrate this amazing event that took place a hundred years ago. Arthur Balfour said that Christianity and civilization have an immeasurable debt to Judaism and the Jewish people. Shamefully ill repaid. Now is our opportunity to stand and declare that we stand with Israel and with the promises of God's word. Please join us November the 7th. Go to the box office now and book your ticket. Yeah, uh, it's an event not to be missed because uh, mm. you're not going to be around for the next one. A uh, hundred years Absolutely. time. Um, I have to ask you, Stephen, can you maybe share some sort of historical insight? How would the Jewish communities around the world have embraced the signing of the Balfour Declaration, realising here it was 
the world superpower of the day, the British Empire, <laughs> producing a letter to Lord Rothschild saying that the British government views in favour the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. It was greeted with enormous <clears throat> joy, as, as you can imagine. I know I looked into the history of my own community, which is the Belfast Jewish community. They're a little outpost of the Jewish world. And I can tell you that during the Sabbath service, following the publication of the, of the declaration, they passed a resolution uh, to give their thanks to the British government for, uh, for the declaration that they'd made. And I think that is probably the only time in the history of the Belfast Jewish community that a, a Sabbath service was used as a platform for a political gesture of that kind. So that, just a tiny little example of one uh, diaspora Jewish community uh, celebrating uh, that. It, 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 the Jews of Russia at the time were facing absolute, they were in a very bad way. If you think about it, the great battles on the Eastern Front were being fought in what was called the Pale of Settlement. That was that part of the Russian Empire where Jews were confined. They weren't allowed to live anywhere in, in the Russian Empire. There was a, uh, a corridor on its uh, western frontier where, where the large majority of the Russian Jewish population lived. There were pitched battles being fought there. The Russian army was notoriously cruel to its own Russian Jewish citizens. They were in a terrible plight. The communist revolution of 1917 uh, was a, a time of tremendous uncertainty. There was civil war following that in Russia where hundreds of thousands of Jews were murdered during that period. So it was, I think, considered the, the it, it was a, to them it was salvation. Mm -hmm. It was a hugely humanitarian gesture on the British government's part. This was a people with a huge need for a homeland that had been dispersed, exiled, persecuted for centuries. And the British government, the declaration that they gave was a pathway mm -hmm. to their salvation. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, it speaks for itself that the Jewish people around the world celebrated. Not that the Jewish people were entirely in agreement because of that old saying of two Jews and three opinions appeared uh, true even then. And there was an element within the British Jewish community that was hostile to the Balfour Declaration. They were tended to be uh, the more established members of the community, very well integrated into British society. And they were concerned that the Balfour Declaration would somehow undermine their status as, as British citizens of the Jewish faith or Jewish persuasion as they saw themselves. So there was an element of the Jewish world that was hostile, but for the vast majority of particularly the poorer Jews, those in Eastern Europe, those living in the UK in the East End of London and, the, and as immigrants, the Balfour Declaration was greeted with tremendous joy. Could I just add, of course, um, as, as Stephen's mentioned, the Pale of Settlement, the other epic story is that of Chaim uh, Weizmann, who came from this place of absolute destitution and, and persecution, poverty, ended up at the top table, you know, there um, in uh, the British Empire, the great power of the day. Uh, what a remarkable life to, to have come from that, obviously learnt the various languages and been part of the early drive of the Zionist movement but the Balfour Declaration would never have happened without his persuasion and we heard from Lord Balfour yesterday reading from Blanche Dugdale's you know biography of Arthur Balfour uh, how uh, the, the two of them just seemed to gel the friendship that you know it's obviously a credit to Lord Balfour who came from the highest echelons of society to someone who was basically a poor immigrant and and what, what an amazing personality to have persuaded, you know, the powers that be, just the forced personality, and I would say the moral force of his argument, that Jerusalem was the home of the Jewish people and London was just a marshland. Um, it, the, these, these resonated, and, and of course we've said that there was, that there was a Christian sympathy in the cabinet, but it wouldn't have happened without Weizmann and his genius, and his power of personality. I think, I think he was like a biblical figure to, no to, to people like Balfour. Yes. Uh, they saw in him the personification of, of, of those uh, Bible characters and Bible stories that mm. they had been brought up with. And I think it was Weizmann's great gift uh, to be able to present the, the, the Jewish people's case mm. uh, in that way as, as being something of epic importance. Uh, and I think that, that, as you said, it was the most remarkable and unlikely friendship between mm. the, the British aristocrat 
and the, uh, the Eastern European immigrant scientist. He was a very important scientist. Mm. We, we shouldn't forget that. Uh, but I think it was Weizmann's diplomatic skills, his charm, uh, the fact that, as you said, his moral case, uh, he, he was a biblical figure in that sense. Uh, and this, you're absolutely right, it was a, a remarkable meshing. And, and he had people. a great sense of humour. So, so I, I've, I've got, uh, I've just been driving with, with Stephen in my car, I've got, I've got one of the biographies of Hein Weizmann. And when the Balfour Declaration was handed by Mark Sykes, the Cabinet Secretary, to Weizmann, who was pacing up and down outside to be taken then to Lord Rothschild, um, Weizmann writes that Mark Sykes came out with triumph and, and said, it's a boy, <laughs> you know, the, with the declaration in his hand. And Weizmann reflected and said, I, I did not like the boy at first. <laughs> he was not the one I had expected. So you say that in some parts of the Jewish community they hadn't supported it. Even Weizmann himself expected more. Um, but as, as we know, it just became that, that sort of seed for you know, later ratifications. Uh, uh, and Stephen, don't we also have to look back at this period of time 100 years ago and also recognise the role that uh, Heim Wiseman played, particularly um, his uh, chemistry uh, ability um, in actually rescuing the British war effort by producing the acetone needed for our shells, which we would never have been able to defeat the German forces had it not been for his industrialization of uh, acetone on an industrial scale. Um, isn't that an indication there that, he, that uh, the British government owed him something, but also the incredible contribution made by the Jewish community to the British war effort during the First World War? For 40,000 Jewish men served during the First World War, another 10,000 nurses and others served as well, uh, out of a population of 300,000. So you can really say that the Jewish contribution to the British war effort helped us win uh, that war 100 years ago. There was certainly a very significant contribution, Simon, you're absolutely right, uh, when you think this was a, a largely an immigrant uh, community uh, showing their loyalty to Britain. Uh, in the most uh, deepest and profound way and actually serving the country at the time of war. Uh, I think that's, that's the case. Uh, Lloyd George later said in, in his, I think in his memoir, uh, that uh, the uh, Weizmann's contribution as a scientist, as you said, with the acetone uh, and the Balfour Declaration was somehow a, a, a reward for that. Now, I know historians don't actually agree with that. They think Lloyd George was perhaps, uh, uh, you know, retrospectively, thinking about that rather than it being a major factor at the time. But it must have been a, a, uh, an entry for uh, Weizmann to meet the, the leading uh, members of the War Cabinet. I'm sure it did have a significant uh, contribution in, in that respect. Uh, so I think there is something to Lloyd George's uh, recollection. But we do know that there were a lot of uh, different motivations uh, in influencing the British government at that time. Right, we've got a few more of your text messages and emails uh, coming through, so uh, please keep them coming. It's always great to hear from you tonight. This one is uh, blessings to you all, Tim. Uh, I cannot be with you on the 7th as I cannot walk, but I'll be with you in spirit. Mm. I'm a true friend of Israel. Um, I love her. They That's from Joyce in Newcastle. They have good disabled access at the Arbor Hall. So Very don't good. feel that you, <laughs> you can't come. <laughs> this one says, uh, shame we don't honour the declaration. Uh, no wonder our country is under judgment, uh, deservedly so. Shalom, Jean. Well, I think this nation is celebrating the Balfour Declaration as we've got an official state visit on behalf of the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, mm. to as well. And this one says... a statement from Theresa May. In uh, excellent. Uh, this one says, um, please remember, uh, he walked in, in peace, the horse was a war horse. Uh, bless you all, and that's Doris. I think she's referring to General Allenby, Allenby yep. mm. uh, in, uh, got off his horse and <coughs> entered into the old city. Uh, this one says, uh, good evening, Simon, <coughs> uh, Tim and Stephen. Thirteen of us are coming in a minibus Whoa. from Stoke-on-Trent uh, for this Royal Albert Hall celebration. I have been excited from the first mention. I'm all looking forward with great joy at being able to share the evening, and that's some shalom from it's Catherine. It's just one uh, a final picture. I mean, it is, is one in a hundred years. There, there isn't going to be another occasion. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to go through this one again. <laughs> it, it's been it's a massive combined effort. It would be a, it would be a great pity if you miss out. So you know, if you can get on a bus or 
or find your way down to the Albert Hall. Tim, have you special. told people how they get tickets? Have you mentioned? Yes, it's it? the Albert Hall box office, and they go from. I think they've got tickets available from fifteen pounds upwards, maybe even less. So if you try the box office and you literally say, "Well, it's for the Balfour event on November the seventh," they'll say, "Yes, I can help you here." And what would you like? Would you like to? Have a box would you like to have a stall seat the arena most of these seats are selling out but um, you know you can also be uh, up in the circle so it is a great occasion I, I don't think there has been such an occasion where so many Bible believing Christians are alongside so many Jews together at a combined event it is an absolute one-off Absolutely. Uh, what impact do you think this will have on the nation, um, Stephen? The fact that here really is a demonstration of Christian Zionist support for Israel and the Jewish people, despite all the haters, uh, despite all the negative campaign surrounding the Balfour Declaration and many of those, as we know, that hate Israel, don't even believe that Israel has a right to exist as a state, even though that Israel has more right to exist, as we saw from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, than the rest of the entire Middle East states, Arab states put together. Well, I think it is significant because without it, uh, those haters would have the only wor word on this. And we know that they're organising a demonstration in central London, uh, we, uh, hostile to Balfour. Uh, we know that all the major trade unions in this country, can you believe this, Tim, are signed up to this hostile march? Because if you oppose the Balfour Declaration, as these demonstrators are doing, what are you actually saying? You're saying you do not want the state of Israel there. That's the bottom line. Without the Balfour Declaration, you're saying, you know, we would rather the state of Israel wasn't there. And what a shame it would be if uh, those demonstrators had the only public word about uh, the Balfour Declaration. They're not having it their own way, thanks to Tim and your committee uh, and the, your vision in, in putting this event on. The Royal Albert Hall is a national platform for us to say that we want to celebrate this hugely historic event. So I think it, it is hugely, hugely significant. Mm. So let's have a look now at uh, the second part of uh, the former Chief Rabbi, uh, Jonathan Sachs, talking about the significance and the legacy of the Balfour Declaration. In 1917, Britain was still deep into World War I, and it would have been so easy for it to ignore the long-term vision and focus instead on the immediacies of war. And it says something for the vision and moral courage of Britain's political leadership at the time, that it said, no, this war that we are fighting is not for ourselves alone, but to create a more just and secure world. And for it to be able to say, to Jews and indeed to um, the Arab world as well. Let us not forget that this was part of a larger picture. The age of empire is over. We want to give back these lands to their original inhabitants. That was visionary and moral politics of a high order and we should salute it in retrospect. The Balfour Declaration was very clear in a rather murky area that it recognized the right of Jews to a homeland, but it also respected the rights of the other people who were living there at the time. So it was predicated on some peaceful coexistence of Jews and Arabs in the land. And for a moment it seemed as if that might happen because two years after the Balfour Declaration, Chaim Weizmann, who was the leader of the Zionist movement at the time, and Emir Faisal, who was the leading Arab politician at the time, came to an agreement in which Jews recognized the claim of Arab nationalism and Muslims recognized the claim of Jewish nationalism. It was a, a very blessed moment in which both sides saw that they would both gain from a Jewish presence in the region. And therefore, it is the sense of possibility that we need to recapture because the reasons for coexistence have not diminished in a hundred years. But what has diminished is the sense that 
each is willing to make space for the other. On the Jewish side, we've always been willing to make space. Um, Weizmann was, Ben-Gurion was. There have been key moments when Israel offered peace and statehood to the Palestinians and unfortunately met with very uncompromising attitudes. I don't want to level blame in any direction here, but the dream of the Balfour Declaration of this coexistence of two distinct groups of people remains the dream today and I don't think we should waste another hundred years in unrealized dreams. My plea is that finally we make space for one another. The Balfour Declaration does dramatically illustrate the power of a single individual let alone a small group, to change history. Don't forget, the return to Zion had been a dream for 2,000 years, but it took Theodor Herzl to turn it into an effective political movement. It took Chaim Weizmann, an extraordinarily charismatic figure, to persuade leading figures in Britain to issue the Balfour Declaration. It took David Ben-Gurion to provide that visionary leadership that brought the state into being. Here are three individuals who changed the pattern of history, and one shouldn't forget the role of women in this story, like Dorothy de Rothschild, Dorothy Pinto, as she was before she was married, who was a key factor in helping Weizmann achieve these results with the British cabinet. So here are individuals who really, by the force and courage of their conviction, brought others with them and changed the world. I believe that the world is a better place for the state of Israel. It's not just Jews who have benefited from the return of a people to its land, even the return of a language, the language of the Bible, to everyday use, the extraordinary achievements of the state of Israel. And one element of that was the Balfour Declaration. So in looking back at this seminal moment in history, we have to say thank you to the vision of the British government then. And we hope the world will come to see how Israel is a symbol of hope for any small and much persecuted people when given the chance to create a new chapter in the story of humankind, which is what Israel is in today's world. former Chief Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, talking about the significance and the legacy of the Balfour Declaration. Now, I've got a few more uh, emails in. Uh, please uh, keep them coming. We are live. We are interactive. Love to know your thoughts. Uh, this one is uh, good evening. Six of us from the CCF Fellowship, and that is uh, Lock and Stock Hall in Preston and Lancashire, going to celebrate the Balfour Declaration. As an Israeli believer, with the excitement, I'm very much looking forward to next Tuesday. Uh, thank you and God bless. And this is from Charles, who writes, uh, Hi, all. Uh, just been watching, but hey, perhaps being naive is a godly way of self-improvement and perhaps will open to being deceived. Uh, and then you put a link to the role that uh, Jewish military r personnel played in Germany, and they did play a significant part uh, in uh, in the German fighting forces during the First World War. This one says, uh, thank you, Revelation TV, for pointing out what the trade unions plan on the 7th of November. Perhaps you might remind them of Genesis 12, uh, 2 and 3, and that's David from Christchurch. Uh, and really, I suppose what we're really talking about here, aren't, aren't we, is um, a, a political movement uh, that, uh, the, that the the world power of the day, the British Empire, uh, recognised that the Jewish people should be able to return to their ancient mm. homeland. But we can't really uh, disguise the fact that really what this is about is God's sovereign redemption for the Jewish people Absolutely. in helping them to return to their ancient covenant yeah. homeland. Uh, and really we're celebrating the fact that uh, the modern state of Israel has been born out of fulfilment of biblical and. prophecy. And this is part of a process. Yeah. And, and this whole question of, is it a force for good? Just look at what Israel does in terms of the, or the realms of, of sort of agriculture, 
technology, you know, and humanitarian work. I mean, um, Benjamin Netanyahu was asked about the fact that Israel's always there first on the scene helping out in earthquake zones. And what do, what do you get out of it, he was asked. And he said, well, we're fulfilling our destiny as a light to the nations, going back to the scriptures. And so, of course, it's a force for good, bringing light to the world. Go, going there, basically out of the national treasury, funding support. And of course, we know when there are Palestinian casualties, they go to Israeli hospitals. You know, they basically fulfill the Hippocratic Oath. Um, uh, and they're, they're, they're blind to nationality. They're there to save life. So I, I think for those who extend a hand of peace uh, to Israel, as Jordan have, they have been blessed, you know, relatively to when they didn't extend a hand of peace. And uh, the United Nations has that scripture from Isaiah 2. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into puning hooks and neither shall they train for war anymore. And as I said to uh, the Board of Deputies yesterday, in the UN, great scripture, but they miss out, and the word of the Lord will go forth from Zion. And Zion is a force for good, because it's a symbol of, of the ultimate peacemaker, the Lord himself. And the, the fact that you can't make peace unless you have a, a, the proper a relationship with your creator and with the one who's, who's, who's actually given the framework for law and order. You can't make peace in moral chaos. And, and that is the problem in the nations of the world today. They're raging uh, against the Lord and his anointed, Psalm 2. Uh, and they say, well, let's throw off the shackles of God's law, of the Torah. Well, you take away the Torah from society or from the community of nations, and you don't make peace. And, and that's why it is a force for good and it is a light to the nations because it's a, a reminder of God's word and that God's word will be fulfilled. The warnings as well as the promises. Absolutely. That's a fantastic contribution. Thank you, Tim. Right, I'm just going to read out a few more of your emails. And this one is from Julian who writes, uh, Gentlemen, I have only just got to the program tonight, but I'm recording it. Uh, Tim, I've just been talking to our mutual friend, uh, Terry H. Mm. I did not know that you would be on the show. I wanted to see if he and Pam were going on the 7th, uh, as I'm finding it difficult to make the trip. Mm. Uh, we had a wonderful discussion about all things that really matter. As you remember, here in Hereford, I look forward to... I, I look to see if I can get there and join you Make all it. in London. And Pam and Terry, Terry. I remember they came on our first... We had 700 that went to Israel in 2004, and they set up a Friends of Israel group down there in Hereford, and you were a great encouragement, I hope you can make it. It would be great to see you. Yeah. And it's uh, nice to hear from you as well, not Jonathan. Far. Hereford's not far from no, me, Oh, come on. That's absolutely. This one says, Israel has been on my heart, I think, before I knew there was a, a God, or that's how it seemed. Um, I have loved the Jewish people and Israel forever. Managed to get there once in the early 70s. You wouldn't recognise Israel now if you're in the early 70s. Uh, and once in the 80s. Uh, both times I worked in a kibbutz, one in Ashkelon, the other one in En Gedi. Israel is the only place apart from Wales where I can truly call my home. Unfortunately, I'll not be there as travelling is a problem. I have no one to go with and I'm a wheelchair user and the distance is a bit far for me now. Uh, I know, uh, sorry, I know how access is very good at the Albert Hall. I'm proud and glad this event is happening. Mm. Uh, well done for everyone involved. My heart is always with you and my Israel. Love and blessings from Jacqueline. Mm. So thank you very much from Jacqueline. And uh, I'll just go on to Stephen before I go back to some of these emails. Um, I was only in Israel like a, few, a couple of weeks ago to attend the Christian Media Summit in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, they, they took us around, and I, it was about two years since I was lost in Israel, back in 2015. And the technological changes and the skyline over Tel Aviv is from, certainly when you see it from um, Ben Gurion Airport, it's quite incredible, as well as uh, Jerusalem with the high-tech investment. Um, clearly, the Jewish people have actually turned uh, the desert uh, and made the desert bloom in fulfilment of biblical prophecy. What would you say is, is, is the greatest thing that represents the state of Israel? I know it's an impossible question, yeah. but that's what I'm asking. The greatest thing. Thing. Well, I, I think, it, it, as you said, it's not just a country that has survived everything thrown at it. And don't forget, this is a country that's in its short uh, history has been invaded on a number of occasions. It's faced 
terrorism virtually uh, every day against its citizens, it doesn't just survive, it thrives. Uh, and you mentioned the deserts blooming. Well, uh, you know, Israel is a country that exports flowers to Holland and potatoes to Ireland. It's absolutely true. Uh, you mentioned the high tech. Well, that, that is amazing. You know, there are more, Israel has more companies listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange, which is the high tech uh, stock exchange in North America than any other country in the world, I think, apart from the United States, possibly Canada and China. But this is a country which is, don't forget, it's the size of Wales, has a population of about 8 million, and yet it's so overrepresented in terms of technological advancements. If you think back to things like drip irrigation and the change that that made, not just in Israel in terms of making the deserts bloom, but throughout the developing world uh, is a major uh, factor enabling arid uh, countries to, to, to grow their own food. I mean, this is just an amazing thing. And you think today with its, its so many different uh, inventions which associated with Israel, from, uh, from voicemail technology to mobile phone technology, uh, it is, and all the medicines, you know, the medicines, I think it's like one in six mm -hmm. NHS prescribed drugs in the UK are manufactured or were developed in Israel. Isn't that just absolutely amazing? Amazing. amazing. Tim, we're down to the last uh, three minutes. So before I ask you a question, I'm just going to read out two very quick emails and yeah. then I'll come back to you. Uh, this one says, my father was in the uh, Royal North Lancashire Army and in the Battle of Besheva. Mm -hmm. He was with uh, General Allenby in 1917, but he was only a private soldier. Uh, he uh, wrote in his war memories before he died in 1989. He was 93. Great program. That's from Beryl. So thank you for that one. Mm -hmm. and, and what a heritage. Wonderful heritage. Uh, this one says, we're coming from Devon. Israel is very close to our hearts. Thank you for doing this, Dave and Elizabeth. Right, in a couple of minutes, um, why is it so important that our viewers who haven't made up their mind to come along and celebrate the Balfour Declaration of the Royal Albert Hall next Tuesday, the 7th of November? Why should they do it? Mm. Well, you've just read about the Battle of Beersheba. I'm wearing a poppy, you know, and uh, a couple of weeks before Remembrance Sunday. Tens of thousands of lives were laid down, British lives uh, uh, and um, Anzacs, Australian, New Zealand. Tomorrow is commemorating the um, 100th anniversary of the Battle of Beersheba. Uh, thousands of lives were laid down in liberating Palestine from what was then Turkish oppression. We, we don't have many opportunities to commemorate such epic events in history. Uh, you, what a waste of an evening if you just sit down watching telly or playing tiddlywinks. Just try and find a way to transport yourself to the Albert Hall. You'll be among friends. It'll be a wonderful occasion. Uh, many from Revelation TV will be there. Many Jewish friends will be there. It's, it's a testimony to the Jewish people who will be with us. It's a statement to the, me the wider media, it's a statement to the church to say, look, we're Christians who are aware of the shocking heritage of Christian anti-Semitism, but we're going to make a new statement for the future which is positive and constructive. Fabulous. And, and Stephen, I give you the last word in 30 seconds. Uh, what does it mean for you and your community to see so many Christians attending such a big event, especially at the Royal Albert Hall, to celebrate the Balfour Declaration. It's a huge encouragement because, as I've said, that for, for many, many years, the Jewish community has sometimes felt that it's alone, uh, facing a tide of, of extremism and hate towards Israel, even within the churches. And sad to say that the Jewish media will headline when a church passes a boycott resolution against Israel or when there's something negative. I think the Royal Albert Hall is a fantastic antidote to all of that, and I think it will be a tremendous eye-opener for the Jewish community to see the numbers coming out. You've already said, Tim, well over 2,000. We know that uh, there'll be more, and it's going to be a fantastic evening. I think a tremendous pro uh, program of, of entertainment and celebration. Uh, Tim and uh, Stephen, thank you so much for being my guests on The Late Show. And I just want to thank you for watching tonight's program. Uh, hopefully you'll be there at the Royal Albert Hall to celebrate the signing of the Balfour Declaration 100 years on.